American University in Bulgaria. Hello, everyone. Uh, we have a small but dedicated crowd tonight. Uh, thank you for being here. This is uh, part of the Communist Studies lecture series at the university that we've had now for a year. And I'm very happy to welcome Christopher Skirborough. But before I, uh, Chris Skirborough, before I uh, present him, I would like to mention that this talk will be recorded by AUBG Talks, a wonderful initiative we have here at the university. And you can watch the talk online at aubg.edu slash talks. Uh, so Chris is uh, a friend and a colleague, and I'm very happy to uh, welcome, him, welcome him at AUBG. He is an associate professor at King's College in Pennsylvania, where he is also the director of the Honors Program. Chris holds a PhD from uh, the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, which is one of the biggest centers for Russian and East European studies, and I think it has the biggest library in the US. Uh, second, after Harvard. Uh, after yeah. Harvard. OK, <laughs> after Harvard. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful place. Uh, Chris is uh, an author of The Late Socialist Good Life in Bulgaria, Meaning and Living in a Permanent President Tent by Lexington Books. Uh, he has also published a number of articles and chapters, including uh, a chapter on today's unseen enthusiasm, communist nostalgia for communism in the socialist humanist brigadier movement, in nostalgia for communism edited by Maria Tudorova and Zsuzsa Gil. Uh, Briar City Project and Socialist Humanism, um, and he has done a lot of research in Haskovo mm -hmm. on Twin Cities projects and on um, the Brigadier Movement, and speaks excellent Bulgarian. <laughs> uh, at yeah. the moment, uh, Chris is uh, a, fellow uh, a fellow at the American Research Center in Sofia. So he's here in six months, and this is why we can benefit from you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris, and welcome. Oh, thank you very much, Emilia. Um, uh, this is actually my second time to ABG. Um, I came in the mid-90s with some students from uh, the math school that I was teaching at in Hoskovo. And it's been really impressive to see the growth. And uh, what, you know, you guys should be very proud of the university you have here. The, the students that I've met, uh, uh, people like Emilia and Marcus, who have, uh, who have um, really um, uh, put the best face forward for the, for the university. So I'm really happy to be here, and I'm really glad to be part of uh, uh, ABG this evening. So thank you for having me, and thank you for that very nice introduction. So I guess I'll get started. In thinking about the question of modernity, and really nowadays, what other questions do historians talk about? I like to use the analogy of the myth of Sisyphus. Now this story seems to work in both the classroom and in conversations over beer in the Kretschma. So when I asked to give a paper at AEBG by Emilia, I figured that I would try to sketch some of these thoughts out and connect the story to my own forays into the history of late communism in Bulgaria. Now most of you know the story of Sisyphus. For the, for the sake of this fact and of time, I'll make my retelling of it brief. Sisyphus was a prince. He was the son of Aeolus of Thessaly, and reportedly the cleverest of men. He was said to think of himself as wise as Zeus. Sisyphus often tricked the gods, most notably when he tied up and incapacitated Hades, the god of death, creating a situation where no one could die, and also inadvertently making a world where no sacrifices could be made to the gods. In response, the gods developed a punishment so severe that Sisyphus would, at the very least, wish himself dead. While living, and death was impossible, he was forced to roll a boulder up a hill in perpetuity. He, al he always made it almost all the way to the top, but always, the instant before he reached the top of the hill, and presumably the end of his ordeal, the boulder slipped free from his grasp, rolled down the hill, and Sisyphus was forced to start his toil anew. So uh, in looking for pictures of Sisyphus, well, that's, I'm uh, sorry, that's the, the first picture. Um, so in thinking about pictures for Sisyphus, this is the best one I could come up with. I guess you can do worse than Titian. Now it is convenient how well Sisyphus's story fits with our own understanding of time. It squares beautifully with Reinhard Koselleck's description of both apocalyptic time, a non-modern, cyclical understanding of time, that is, the continuality of rolling the boulder again and again to no discernible destination, and progressive time, the modern belief in history as, a, as linear and teleological, a means to a purpose. In this case, 
the woefully mistaken belief that this time, at last, the boulder would make it up the hill. It is this tragic comic belief that caused Kafka to adopt Sisyphus as the embodiment of the absurdity of life, toil in the absence of meaning. Sisyphus, thus, lives eternally on the boundary between pre-modern and the modern era, or perhaps he lives in both temporalities simultaneously. In his, the myth of Sisyphus, which I've had different friends independently describe to me as either the most pessimistic or most optimistic book they've ever read, Albert Camus uses the story of Sisyphus to pose what he claimed was the only important question in philosophy in the absence of God, that is, in the modern era. Camus asks, in a world without meaning, is one obligated to commit suicide, right, without God, right, without meaning, or is your obligation to kill yourself? Camus' answer, thankfully for us, is to see Sisyphus' story as one of revolt, either the absurd revolt of irrationality against reason, or the noble, doomed revolt of man against fate. In either case, Camus asks us to imagine Sisyphus happy. Every modern political movement, from the Atlantic Revolution on, have had to deal on some level or another with the question of Sisyphus. Fundamentally, to take up Camus' charge, right, to imagine Sisyphus happy, one had to believe in the promise of finally making it up the hill with your boulder. One had to believe in the future glory of the nation, or that colonialism really was bringing about the blessings of civilization and a better world. That the invisible hand of the market worked in a utilitarian fashion, bringing the greatest amount of happiness to the greatest number of people or, in the immortal words of George W. Bush, that the market would allow us to take the pie higher. You had to believe that communism would overcome the contradictions of capitalism and bring about a radiant new future. Progressive time demanded a belief in progress and material evidence of that same progress. The road up the hill, however, particularly when burdened with a boulder, was not, is not, an easy one. And despite the best intentions of modernist planners, stagnation is as much the story of modernity as are the storming of fortresses. Revolutions age. Material conditions change. New generations are born. One has to demonstrate that the struggle is worth it and to provide some comfort along the way. If not land, bread, and peace, people at least need circuses to go along with their bread. Now, much recent scholarship has focused on the question of late socialism and this very phenomena, on new communist subjectivities and questions of consumption. As the socialist system moved into middle age, the drive to build socialism became replaced with the necessary desire to live in a refined, developed so socialism. Sisyphus moved from steaming up the hill to enjoying the roller coaster effect of the boulder's aimless meanderings he was to imagine himself happy. More to the point, socialism in the late 1960s and 1970s seemed to enter its middle class iteration. Enjoying the fruits of earlier labor became the order of the day. Work overalls were replaced by miniskirts, shovels by television. The result was a system that, to those looking, seemed permanent, stable, or forever. This paper, my work in Bulgaria this next six months as a fellow at ARCS, is an investigation of what that forever looked like as it fell apart. As I conceptualize it, and not only I, the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe can best be understood as a failure of embourgeoisement, attempts to legitimize the regimes of Eastern Europe through the creation of a middle class, consumerist, communist society. Right, so the, the, the ironies in, implicit in that, I think, are, are, are really very interesting. A society that, despite its very real material successes, found itself trapped by those very successes. So today, with your permission and forbearance, I'd like to talk in some detail about the underlying deep sense of disappointment in this late socialist good life. Uh, the somewhat oxymoronic middle-class socialism reflected in socialist realist art. Now, I want to be clear, uh, mostly to avoid angry questions at the end of this talk. I want to be very, very clear and very upfront. This disappointment, the disappointment I'm about to talk about, was fundamentally and unequivocally 
a reaction to the shoddy nature and often absence of the very goods socialism was supposed to deliver. Materially, the 1980s were not a good time in Bulgaria or anywhere else in the Soviet orbit. It was hard to believe then that the boulder would ever make it up the hill. Scarcity was very much part of the story, and this in many ways made consumption even more important. But, and this is I think a very important but, Bulgarian dissatisfaction with communism was also, and equally importantly, a reflection of the ennui, struggle, and boredom of living a life ordered by purely consumerist agendas. The myth of Sisyphus is to be read as a tale of late socialism as a consumerist discourse, and perhaps as an object lesson for what may come to be called late capitalism. Traditionally, the narrative of communism and explanations for its collapse follow one of two linked trajectories, one material and one ideological, or if you prefer, theory and praxis. The first traces the rise and fall of the Eastern European industrial economies built with all their inefficiencies and terrors on the ruins left by the Second World War. In this narrative, the epical days of building socialism during the late 1940s and 1950s created something of an economic miracle on the ground, a miracle that found Bulgaria ahead of her capitalist neighbors in many measures of economic development by the mid-1960s. Full employment, a rapidly developing urban economy and infrastructure, and the promise of even better tomorrows painted the horizon. Building socialism moved into living and enjoying developed socialism with the idea that the emergence of a better communist world was only a few subway stops down the line. Now, it was the lived experience of the 1980s that gave lie to the illusion of prosperity of the socialist good life of the 1960s and 1970s, and that story is a story I, I tell in, in my book and other, other places. We'll leave that alone a little bit for now. So to make this long story short, uh, ultimately, the planned economies, uh, the planned industrial economies were unable to adapt to and adequately compete with the transformations in capitalism as it moved into its post-industrial iteration. State socialism was unable to close non-productive factories. To replace workers with machines was ideologically problematic. And most importantly, centralized planning was unable to match the logic of the market in proper allocation of resources and distribution of goods. Stephen Kotkin and others have persuasively argued that the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe was driven, driven primarily by, the, by an establishment that felt it had more to gain by jettisoning than by pursuing a communist ideology which served, on a break, served as a break on the development of a fully realized middle class society measured in purchasing power and its own material standards. In short, the economic crisis of the 1980s forced elites to choose either the middle class project understood as capitalism and their own material prosperity or the promises of ideology, equally distributed abundance, which was never achieved. Throughout Eastern Europe, communist parties surrendered power and, after renaming themselves, entered the democratic process that dismantled the checkered legacy of communism on the path to liberal democratic capitalism. The Warsaw Pact and Common Con became NATO and the European Union. The material triumphed over the ideological, and new ideological visions filled the vacuum. The market over the planned economy, and a straight line from east to west directed our understanding of the transition. Reagan's morning in America began to dawn in Eastern Europe as the man himself passed into senescence. Now I'm not here to make war on easy targets and simple comforting narratives. Few of us here, in any case, have bought the goods. Material devastation and the, I'm sorry, material deprivation and the glitter of capitalism do play a role in what Bulgarians wonderfully call not collapse, but the changes. My point today, however, is that the process most destructive to the stability of the late socialist system was the decision to ask people to understand themselves primarily as consumers rather than as producers of goods. Talk about your alienation of labor. This leads to a whole series of questions that I'm now in Bulgaria trying to puzzle out. How were the seeming ironies of consumption as a measure of the success of the socialist system squared with an ideology and a long history favoring production as a metric? What were middle class socialists to look like? In the end, the party, and I suppose the people, chose the material over the ideological, and as a result, ideology itself was hollowed out. 
This leads us to the second explanation for the collapse of communism, the absence of belief. If communism, as every modern system, is best understood as a subject creating discourse, gears towards creating subjects who act in the world according to a set of fixed precepts. Late socialism was ideologically undergirded by what Vera Dunham calls a big deal. In this story, Eastern European socialist systems are best understood as a series of bloodless marriages. Those in power settled for popular acquiescence, demonstrated in the rhetoric of, and to a smaller degree, the practice of communism. This acquiescence was purchased by popular belief in the material benefits that the system would deliver, and it often did, rather than by real belief in communism per se. It was a Kafkaesque, or if you prefer, Sisyphean display. The general understanding under communism was, as the old saw goes, we pretend to pay work, they pretend to pay us, although people really did get paid. Or more to the point, we pretend to believe and they leave us alone and we get an apartment with a rubber tree in it. Increasingly, people retreated into their private lives and belief was relegated to May Day parades and the wooden language and often wooden applause at Communist Party speeches. This applause was purchased through the developing language and practice of consumption and leisure um, that emerged under late socialism. Communism promised more. A better tomorrow, measured in square footage and apartments, cars rolling off assembly lines, and Black Sea vacations. If, to paraphrase Lenin, communism equals all power to the Soviets and electrification of the whole country, communism had arrived, and then some, by the 1960s, one by the 1970s, rather, one generation after the revolutions in Eastern Europe. The question of the era then, the question of the 70s and 80s, necessarily became, in the presence of such abundance, in the face of developed socialism, this is of course the language of the time, where were the communists? Consumption and leisure under late socialism thus became the central pillars of socialist legitimacy, a field of competition with capitalist societies and an important aspect of socialist subjectivity. And to a large degree, it worked. From the early 1960s until the slowdown of the late 1970s, Bulgarians continued to see their purchasing power and opportunities for leisure advance. The stability, social advancement, expansion of cultural outlets, and relative personal affluence of the era of stagnation were powerful sources of support for the system. For many Bulgarians, even today, the 1960s and 1970s remain a golden age of prosperity evoking nostalgic images of winters in the mountains, summers at the sea, and plenty of sausage. We were just talking about this uh, uh, over coffee. State support of leisure and cultural activities and the development of the private and the idiosyncratic were from the perspective of party planners then, both a vehicle for delivering a vision of the socialist good life and a means for developing well-rounded, well harmonious socialist subjects, which is of course a central goal of socialist humanism. From the perspective of those same would-be subjects, the programs represented both the potentials and malfunctions of socialism. This peculiarity of late socialism was perhaps unavoidable, and it highlighted the central dynamic of the period. Bulgarians, ultimately, were living through two revolutions. One material, constructing the political economy necessary for the arrival of communism and communists, and the second, cultural, entailing the transformation of mentalité, where people freed from exploitation and alienated labor would become harmoniously developed individuals. So this term, harmoniously developed individuals, um, which appears everywhere in the official text of the 1970s and 1980s under uh, Bulgarian communism, most prominently emerged in the 1975 Comprehensive Program for, the Na for National Aesthetic Education, put forth by Ludmila Zhivkova and the, the Committee on Culture, which along with the concomitant idea of living and beauty, provided a model for what these new communist subjects would look like. Ideally, in the words of Konstantin Popov, a leading contemporary theorist of socialist culture in this time, quote, during this period, a feeling for beauty and labor in everyday life, in relationships with others, and a desire for self-improvement would be developed in everyone. Right? So they become these harmoniously developed individual. Sisyphus, 
freed from his backbreaking label by the arrival of communism, or at least socialism, would begin to be a different, better, more harmonious person. Now, Bulgarian communists understood the importance of the Cultural Revolution from the very beginning. The idea, of course, uh, was first put into practice during the revolutionary days in the Soviet Union. Right? The idea of the Cultural Revolution you know, comes from the time of Lenin and Lunacharsky. As early as 1958, Dodor Zhivkov pointed to the potential dangers of succeeding in the material revolution at the expense of developing correct cultural attitudes, that is, creating a material base for communism without developing the sort of uh, correct ideological orientation. Speaking to the Union of Bulgarian Writers, right, the vanguard of, of socialist realism's engineers of the soul, Zhivkov, after outlining the material successes of the Bulgarian industrial economy, we've built these many factories, we've created this many blast furnaces, we've uh, done all these fantastic things, indicated, quote, the development of the nation's economy and of its productive forces, no matter how great they may be, does not and cannot exhaust the entire problem of the construction of the socialist society. The problem of refashioning the consciousness of the working people, of their communist re-education comes to the fore. As you know, consciousness always lags behind the economy in its development. It is refashioned much more slowly than the latter." End quote. Closing this gap, the gap between the material conditions for communism and communist consciousness was the central challenge of late socialism. Right? That is the main task. Consumption, that is correct consumption, was the space where this circle was to be squared, right? where this gap is going to be closed. The, the, the problem is the, the, the lag time between the material conditions for communism and communist consciousness. Consumption is where that's going to be mitigated, right? where, that's going to be, uh, uh, where that problem is going to be most seriously attacked. Consumption, of course, presented several problems for party planners and there would be communist consumers. By asking for subjects to understand themselves as consumers rather than as producers, as they had in early socialism, the Eastern European socialist economies competed with the capitalist economies of Western Europe and the United States on their own terms. Right? In the West, we were asked to think of ourselves primarily as consumers first, workers second, if at all, which is why it's OK to shut down factories and, uh, and, and send jobs abroad or what, or what have you. Um, that's, that's something that's alien, at least, to the, the rhetoric of communism in its early days. So the Eastern European communist societies and the capitalist societies of the West were essentially competing on, uh, on capitalist ground. The social systems could not keep up. The televisions, automobiles, and apartments constructed in Bulgaria and Eastern Europe could not be manufactured as efficiently and as cheaply as they could in regions where the profit motive ruthlessly cut the fat, including the producers themselves, from production mechanisms. Thus, Eastern Europeans were never fully satisfied with the goods designed to stand as symbols for the socialist good life. Right? So the goods themselves were inferior. Right? Equally importantly, and I think probably even more importantly, by moving away from ideology and towards consumer goods as the central legitimizing trope for the communist system, the leaders of these regimes quickly discovered the impossibility of satisfying these demands. Right? Capitalism is built on the premise of, of manufacturing desire in consumers, fulfilling those desires, and then creating a brand new one. Right? It's, this, it's this constant race to try to satisfy these desires. The tyranny of more, the tyranny of more, right? the insatiability of consumption doomed the system to a Sisyphean attempt for new and better diversions, diversions that the West was quite simply better designed to fulfill. The race towards a satisfying life in late socialist Eastern Europe then was run against boredom. Now, I, I have to warn you a little bit. I, t I was talking to Gerald Creed at the last AAAS. I said, what I really want to research is boredom in Bulgaria. He's like, how the hell, how the hell are you going to research boredom? And I was like, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm here to try to figure that question out. Right? How, am I, how, do you, how do you study boredom? Right? How do you measure boredom? How do you make sense? Of, I, I'm not sure. But that's one of the things I'm going to try to talk a little bit about now and hopefully figure out um, before I go back to America. Now, my own thinking about boredom in Eastern Europe was triggered by the opening lines of Patrick McGuinness's novel on the collapse of communism in Romania called The Last Hundred Days. It's a great novel if anybody has, uh, has uh, any inkling. He writes the following, quote, in 1980s Romania, boredom was a state of extremity. There was nothing neutral about it. 
It strung you out and stretched you, tugged away at the bottom of your day like a shingle scraping at a boat's hull. In the West, we've always thought of boredom as slack time, life's lift music sliding off the ear. Totalitarian boredom is different. It is a state of expectation already heavy with its own disappointment. The event and its anticipation braided together in a continuous loop of tension and anticlimax. So this got me wondering, right? I mean, <laughs> how exactly was boredom under late socialism different than that experienced in the West? What are the stakes? Why should we care if it is different, right? What was the nature of boredom in late socialist Eastern Europe, and what role did it play in the collapse of the system? Now, in writing about late socialism in Eastern Europe, Boredom as a trope is fast approaching cliché, an accepted, if understudied, truism. Boredom, illuminated in the dim light of the era, stands as shorthand for a general sense of lack amongst late socialist subjects. Right, lack. Generally, this lack is understood one of two ways, produced either by Catherine Verdery's etatization of time and the concomitant shortages, that is, lining the victory of Socialism Boulevard to cheer Mobutu's passing motorcade, and then lining up to purchase whatever was on the shelves in the state stores, or arrived at through the cheerful, or perhaps surly, assurance of living in a world of ritual and routine. So fully knowable and predictable that traditional notions of tense fade away, leaving a feeling of living in a permanent present. This, of course, borrows from Alexei Yurchak, but also tellingly from Ivalo Dichev's Erotics of Stagnation. I love Ivalo Dichev's work, so I just want to give him a call out. One vision prioritizes a lack of goods and time, a boredom born out of being forced to do monotonous and tiresome things, a boredom born of deprivation. The other understands boredom as an almost pleasant product of certainty, a boredom born out of an absence of surprises. Combined, these twin boredoms produced both stability and unrest, revolutionary rage and shabby solidity. Art in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, both official and unofficial, has a long and distinguished history of representing just this boredom. Benedict Erofeyev makes the dangers and pleasures of living in a permanent present tense appear viscerally in his Moscow to the end of the line, Moscow Petushki, as early as 1968. I don't know if any of you have read that, but it's essentially, this, uh, it's a great book. Uh, it's published initially in Samizdata. Uh, this drunk guy rides a subway for the entire, uh, he just sort of, he ends up dying in the end, but it's, it's a great book. Uh, but it's all about boredom and absence of place, and it's, it's really, really fantastic. Vitaly Komar, and Alex Melamed present the absurdities of routinized public life hilariously and dangerously in their ideal slogan series. And from now on, I'm going to show a lot of pictures. So thank you for bearing with me up until this point. So we'll see if this goes. So they have, they have this, uh, and these are actually shown in Soviet art galleries, the, uh, what they call um, uh, this is the, um, the, uh, uh, their ideal slogan series. And so, of course, these are, these are lozungi, or slogans that you would see on buildings all over here some, from Hoskovo, because that's, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so they've taken these essentially out of the context of the, uh, of the public space and putting it in an art gallery. And in so doing, they've completely changed the meaning, right? It's one that these slogans become meaningless because they're constantly routine and repeated, and they, they become absurd, right? So in a gallery, you know, we were born to turn fairy tales into reality. It's kind of laughable, right? And it becomes even more laughable when it's replaced by the ideal slogan. They say, the, as long as the form is correct, right? Red, black, ground, white letters, ends in an exclamation point, you're good to go, right? So the ideal slogan is, in fact, one that is both completely knowable and completely devoid of any meaning, right? It doesn't, it, it's, 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 it's functionally um, well, void of meaning, right? Um, and well, I love this one, particularly quotation, right? <laughs> Give the appearance of a quotation of Marx or Lenin, and that's all that matters. Writing in Hoskovo, Bulgaria, which we will turn to shortly, Ruman Starkovsky presents late socialism as a series of smashed cockroaches, tall glasses of rakia, and harsh cigarettes painted against a backdrop of nothing meaningful to do in his short story collection, Lyatno Vreme, or Summertime. Perhaps most famously, one that you are probably all familiar with, Milan Kundera paints a picture of socialist Czechoslovakia as a story of personal regimes of love and sex fought against the repressive monotony, pettiness, and stupidity of the communist system. In each of these cases, and many, many, many more, the general narrative is more or less the same. 
With public life devoid of meaning, people retreated into the interior private sphere to till at their own personal windmills. Now as these texts were understood in the West, they were testimonials to the impoverishment of the Eastern European system, where people longed for goods, right? where they longed for Sony Walkmans or Kent cigarettes or Levi's. As the story goes, once boredom in the private sphere fully matched that in the public, the system disappeared. When approaching the history of the 1980s, as I'm about to do, the historian is tempted to seek visions of deprivation and disgust with, or fantasy and escape from, a denuded present. Now part of this is surely a question of translation and availability. Limitations of language often leave those of us working in the West using translations of Eastern European texts suited to the market. Sad to say, I've yet to read Kundera in Czech or French. Dissidents sold in the West and got rewritten into English. As a result, during the Cold War, the satire and resistance of unofficial or ironically official texts were more suited to the tenor of the era, and they told those of us in the West what we wanted to hear. Wit won an audience in the face of the technical precision and solidity of official socialist realist art. And socialist realist art, ironically or not, became understood as the work of middle brow conformist artists for their middle class conformist audience. Mass produced pap or Disneyland on canvas, socialist Disneyland on canvas. As a result, gloomy, brilliantly intelligent, doomed writers, often in exile, became the face of Eastern European culture as it was understood in New York and Paris. Tens of thousands of Americans who traveled to Eastern Europe in the 1990s, and full disclosure, I was one of them, went to meet Vaclav Havel, or at least Jelu Jelev. <laughs> These writers' job was to point out the gray monotony and inhumaneness of the communist system in Eastern Europe. They became the embodiment of the, quote, tragedy of Central Europe. Again, this is Kundera's phrase. Tragedy being the death of a multilingual, highly cultured, highly European, whatever that means, transnational world of high culture and ideals. And left unsaid but understood was this world, Central Europe's replacement by row upon row upon row of Panielki. Now understanding Eastern Europe and communism through the dissident lens of tragedy and irony, this is what we saw. Dearth, brutality, but most importantly, banality. And I want to take this idea, the idea of the banal, right, seriously. Now this problem has become only more pronounced since the collapse of communism and the proclaimed victory of liberal democratic capitalism. As a result, we are predisposed to understand the collapse of communism as the natural result of a boring, poor, and vaguely tyrannical system. It is possible, however, to read these pieces, pieces like this, which I love, I think is brilliant, and I love Komar and Melamed, uh, I think they're fantastic. Uh, but it's possible to read these pieces and the, the, the pieces of official socialist culture another way, to take socialist realism seriously on its not quite human face, to see dissidents as dissidents. People, after all, were, most of the time, quite pleased to get their panelki, as much as complaining about them became a national sport after people were safely in them. And I'd like to spend the rest of my time here talking, taking a look at some visual art read against the competing and complementary narratives of consumption and collapse. You know, so Bulgarian painting during the, late, during the 1980s, socialist realism and otherwise, is indeed dark, featuring paintings redolent in an almost palpable boredom. One based, however, not so much on a lack, but rather on a surfeit of goods. The paintings themselves make goods a defining subject of their work. The paintings, in effect, are still lifes with people. Ultimately, they are genre pieces built on the consumption of boredom, an understanding that toaster ovens are not a good way to envision the life well lived. Despite the lower standards of living, again measured in goods and purchasing power, vis-a-vis -vis their Cold War competition, the Eastern European systems were remarkably good at producing stuff by almost any other historical measure. Socialist realist art of the era reveals the emptiness of that stuff. The first, 
and to my knowledge, the last attempt to catalog these images in the visual uh, arts of the 1980s in Bulgaria was a 2002 retrospective at the National Gallery of Foreign Art in Sofia entitled, okay, great title, A Decade in the Depots, <laughs> the 80s, Known, Unknown, and Forgotten Paintings, Sculptures, and Etchings, curated by Vesela Nojarova and Svetlana Kumujieva. To me, this study sums up the typical narrative of late socialism waiting to collapse in Bulgaria. Nojarova understands the period as one dominated by, in her words, melancholy, poetic loneliness, alienation, and existentialism, inclined towards, again in her words, darker, monochromatic color, so different than today's read liberal democratic capitalism's decorative function of art. Artists included in the exhibition are described as spending the 1980s living in a parallel world between visions of socialist ideology and the true, again a quote, important for art issues. The images they produce focus on, in their words, the self, and they reveal an innate introvertness and a strong interest towards the intimate world. And the search for, again another quote, the place of man in the micro space of human existence that look into the simple things in life. That is, socialism is an inhuman system. People survived by splitting themselves into two, living by what Gail Kligman calls the politics of duplicity. Art, particularly unofficial art, demonstrated what people, at least in Nujarava and Komojiva's words, people were, well, demonstrates what people were really thinking. Now, for both philosophical and political reasons, I find the idea of a bifurcated self problematic. I don't really buy Gil Kligman's stuff. Uh, I, I don't take it very, uh, well, I do take it seriously, but I don't find it compelling. Um, but let's ignore that for just a moment and assume that these paintings do reveal a hidden story about how people lived and found meaning under socialism. The images themselves reflect the generally understood tenor of the times. Depressing industrial interiors, turning industrial landscapes. Now, socialist realism is famous for these industrialni paesaggi, these industrial landscapes where you would see mountain, the, you know, the real mountains replaced by factories, right? And so, for the first time in the 1980s, you get to actually go inside of these factories and you see that, that they're, you know, uh, not all they're cracked up to be, they're Pachomkin villages of sorts. So, depressing industrial interiors, turning industrial landscapes inside out, dance with images of violence and psychosis. Right? Uh, paintings center on escape, either into the pleasures of uh, presumably pre-socialist village life, painted in a naive style that violates the precepts of traditional socialist realism, or people escape into an airy fantasia of sex and pleasure. I'm trying to make sure I'm around the right place. These paintings take the viewer inside a dream theater um, of dark, heavily furnished rooms where people sit and wait. Paintings are always centered around the principle of frozen movement. These paintings evoke a sense that movement is perhaps possible, but not worth very much. In Kalia Zografova's uh, A Small Break, a knitter allows her ball of yarn to roll aimlessly from her lap while she stares blankly in the distance. A break from what? From work? From knitting? Knitting itself does not seem to be providing any real pleasure. One can imagine the sitter taking out her stitches and starting her project over as soon as she finishes. Rather, it fills the time between or while the subject sits for portraits. Self-portraits of artists filled the exhibition. In each case, an air of melancholy fills the canvas. Misra Prahuva stares back at the viewer, luxuriant to what appears to be a velvet painting smock, uh, posing for herself. Yubin Zidarov, I love Yubin Zidarov's work, and Lilian Ruseva are painters not painting. Zidarov constructs a dark image of painter's block, right, as pure a reflection of boredom as I can imagine. Ruseva idles a coffee cup as she waits, for how long, to begin or to renew her day. These are portraits of, of, of the boring, right, of a world with nothing meaningful to do. They are not, however, portraits of dep deprivation. Prahova paints in velvet. Zidarov sits in a studio littered by the tools of his trade, a trade that in a strictly materialist sense is dealing in luxury goods. And Ruseva sits in a relatively well-apportioned kitchen in what assumes is her apartment. 
all have time to sit. To sit and paint, or not, as the case may be, and or have their portraits painted. Tellingly, all have a conflicted relationship to the goods that mark their very prosperity. Coffee to drink before it gets cold, yarn to knit as it aimlessly rolls away, paint to turn into painting. None of these things seems to offer any release. Within the context of the Cold War, subjects presented are indistinguishable from those in Western Europe or the United States of the era. Goods mask the individual. Tomo Vervanos, lady guest, approximating a 1970s Hollywood starlet, may as well be a mannequin. Identity cooked down to oversized sunglasses and a stylish wrap. Right? That's who she is. When movement is arrived at in the paintings, it, can, it continues as a commentary on goods as a measure of the good life. Right? Ivan Dimov's wonderfully titled Movement, in case the viewer missed the possibility amongst the genre, could take place in any shopping mall in Detroit, or at least Detroit before the fall, as a young mother takes her son out shopping for shoes. Gordon Marinov plays with the idea of movement, a movement that his possessions anchor him against. Tekla Alexieva understands her era as one of movement. Her era itself is a, as an era at the crossroads, a junction of both defined and clogged by the, art, by the act of consumption. Cars provide the promise of an escape from boredom, but ultimately provide merely traffic. The true important for art issues, what Nojadova speaks of, the struggles within the, again, in, intimate world of the artist, the questions the art asks are how to live in a world defined by commodities. And of course, under state socialism, and I would argue capitalism, the subject, him or herself, is the commodity par excellence. This realization gives the paintings a special tragic resonance and power. Right? These are commentaries on the question of consumption, the question of commodification, uh, as it plays to the development of the self, right? how one defines your, the, the, yourself, how you define yourself through uh, your interaction with commodities. For the historian, the paintings collected in this exhibition are illustrative but problematic. They combine official, unofficial, and semi-official art, but equally importantly, the collection was created after the collapse of communism, which reveals hidden voices, but also distorts those it includes, altering their meaning. The narrative of the exhibition is, in effect, more a commentary on the decades after the collapse of communism than it is on the 1980s themselves. At the same time that Nojadova and Kumujiva were bringing known, unknown, and forgotten artists from Bul the Bulgarian 1980s to audiences in Sofia, I was putting together my own collection of art and artists working under communism in Bulgaria as displayed in the Hoskovo Regional Art Gallery. And this next project is going to have nothing to do with Hoskovo, so <laughs> it's like moving away from Hoskovo. Over the course of three months, the gallery and its archive was open to me, and I was allowed to photograph and document each piece added to the gallery to its inception in 1962 until 2002. So essentially, I went down to the, to the, to the archive. They said they took out every painting, every sculpture, and said they let me, it was fantastic. Let me take pictures of it, figured out how much it cost. Uh, it was really great. So this included close to 3,000 paintings, prints, and sculptures. Since my own work focused on the 1960s and 1970s, at least my work at that time, those works of late and post-communism more or less sat in files on my desktops, tugging at my conscience and waiting for a second project, uh, which this is. The collection of paintings from the 1980s at the Hoskovo Gallery, uh, the paintings themselves, have the advantage of working fully within official art and the shifting genre of socialist realism. The gallery in Hoskovsky Okrug was a central location for contact between the state, artists, and the public. Within this space, meaning and value were assigned to artworks, Narratives for action and understanding were produced and ritualized. Ways of viewing were privileged and publics were created. They were paintings that people saw and thought about, and they limbed the perimeter of what was possible in public discourse in the streets of southeastern Bulgaria at the time. Now, the paintings in the Hoskovo Gallery trace many of the themes from Rajadova and Kumujiva's exhibit. Fantasia, the private and the personal. Visions of alternative world and boredom. Within both galleries, in Sofia and Hoskovo, socialist realism as a window to a happy present and glorious near future became increasingly rail, rare as the 1980s unfolded. So we're going to look at some of these quickly. Portraits 
are escaping from the real, right? So this idea of this moving into Fantasia, um, this moving to the less easily definable, moving from the uh, collectively uh, apprehendable, right? Just uh, paintings with a, with a common narrative thread give way to art that is much more difficult, uh, leading almost toward, towards abstraction to make sense of. Um, so that's one, one thing, um, and uh, I have other work that talks about that. But I want to talk a little bit more about the representational stuff. Within the gallery itself, portraits in particular reflect a general sense of timelessness and aimlessness amongst relative plenty. Boredom leeches out the erotic charge of private guitar lessons. People sit in interminable silence. Here, the silence of the genre and the physical act of sitting for a portrait became a powerful metaphor for the boredom implicit in the system, right? Sitting in this silent space, right, this, this idea. Interiors remain dark and well furnished. Overstuffed chairs compete with wicker chairs on balconies as places for people to sit and lounge their days away. Everyone was waiting, but rather than in a state of expectation, what, after all, are they waiting for? An expectation already uh, heavy with its own dis uh, disappointment, as McGuinn says, it is a boredom built of having desires fulfilled and finding them wanting. Cities are without exception void of people, absent color, and any sense of movement or vitality. Village scapes reflect a romantic vision for a past outside of the modern industrial consumer society. Right, so several, these are the empty cities, uh, cities of villages, which uh, sort of take on this, uh, again, this era of Fantasia, uh, painted often in naive style. Now, these paintings engage in a worldwide critique of the modern that is shared across the Iron Curtain. I think it's important to take this within the context of, uh, of, of worldwide moves that are taking place from the six, late 60s on. They take their cue from that motto of Paris in 1968 underneath the cobblestones, the beach. They trace their origins to Camus' Sisyphean question, how can one find meaning in the modern world, right? How can one find meaning? Consumption seemed, at best, a cursed answer. Komar and Melamed named their art movement Sots Art, self-consciously in dialogue with the anti-consumerist love affair with consumption, pop art. Their first exhibition in New York City after leaving the Soviet Union was entitled Nostalgia for Socialist Realism. And the paintings in both galleries, in Sofia and in Hoskovo, are written in a nostalgic genre. They are a commentary for good or ill on the difficulties in replacing ideology with consumption, belief with boredom. In part, this boredom was born of people getting what they wanted. The revenge of the moor was expressed with a yawn. Diversions failed to divert, and Sisyphus's boulder rolled back down the hill. So, thank you, and thank you very much for having me. I, I look forward to your questions. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. A wonderful lecture, and we can Thanks. open to questions. Yeah. All right. Um, I mean, there is this um, consumerist promise that comes with a communist system, and as you said, it kind of becomes stronger from, let's say, the mid-1960s, 70s, 80s onwards, and then seems kind of not to, fulfill, not to be fulfillable, let's say, mm -hmm. in the 1980s. Um, I'm actually wondering um, how to interpret this. Um, a, the um, uh, one, one, one possibility or one, one way to, to interpret this would probably be to say that um, did probably communism actually fail to establish its own genuine discourse mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and instead it basically got trapped in this um, yeah, a competition with the West and simply claiming to be better at mm -hmm. uh, the same things that the the Western liberal democratic markets uh, economy was also trying to do. Uh, mm -hmm. So kind of a failure to say that we're doing something different and therefore mm -hmm. we're not even engaged in some sort of a competition with mm -hmm. uh, the West. Uh, so we offer simply different things. Mm -hmm. And now why, why did that actually happen if it was really like that? Mm -hmm. uh, and to which degree uh, do, well, 
and, and, and the, the follow-up question actually for me is in this context, how significant is actually the period we're looking at? Um, so the late socialist period. Um, uh, how to which degree does this kind of uh, enlighten or highlight the, the problems that you have uh, touched upon? Mm -hmm. My uh, sense is that um, this uh, emphasis on consumerism probably is also something to do with um, the, the f actually a failure of the system that dates back much more than just to the 1960s, uh, but probably even to the early 1950s. Mm -hmm. Of course, here we have to distinguish probably between a different context, the Bulgarian one, mm -hmm. uh, versus, uh, let's say, uh, the ones of the East Central European mm -hmm. countries, uh, East Germany, Poland, Hungary, mm -hmm. primarily also Czechoslovakia to mm -hmm. a certain degree, and it seems to me that in these countries, uh, the communist regimes were already in a very defensive position from the mid-1950s. Sure, so sure, absolutely. We think of the uh, uh, revolts in these countries. Mm -hmm. And they basically try to kind of um, domesticate mm -hmm. uh, this um, the opposition that existed there mm -hmm. uh, with the promise of consumerism. Right, right. You know? uh, and, and this exactly takes me to this question: How significant is actually the period mm -hmm. that you're looking at in that uh, in that context? Okay. Um, and I think I'm supposed to repeat the question, so I'll try to do justice to your question. No, 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 that's fine. So I'll try to do justice to, to this very good question. Um, uh, so I think it was a, a two-part question. I'll try to paraphrase and then try to answer. Uh, um, Professor uh, or Marcus was talking about uh, this idea of consumer process, uh, promise being unfulfillable and perhaps the failure that we see this boredom that I was talking about, this failure of the system itself, the rationales behind its collapse, uh, dealt or, or, or explainable by uh, sort of the inability to create a, a genuine, unique communist discourse, right? Yes. Um, um, and I think that's absolutely correct. I think that's exactly the problem is as you're moving from, you know, sort of early communism to developed socialism. This is the language they call, uh, they, they, they have the Congress in 1958, the victory of communism uh, Congress. And the question becomes, how do you define what, what developed socialism is going to look like? How do you make sense of it? And I think in part, uh, it's it's a it's a lack of imagination, right? It's a it's a it's, a, it's an un, inability to come up with something other than consumption as a way to uh, uh, to define what late 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 late, uh, late communism is going to look like, right? Uh, uh, you know, in terms of the Soviet bloc wide, it goes. You know, Khrushchev's kitchen debate is, of course, the, the quintessential example of that, right? Him, him uh, uh, talking at the America House in uh, Skolniki Park. So I think you're, you're you're dead on there, and I think it, it uh, one of the interesting things uh, about um, this 1975 uh, national nationwide program on aesthetic education is you see Ludmila Zhivkova, I think, somewhat ineffectively uh, trying to come up with this idea of living in beauty as a way that is going to be somehow different than uh, uh, than one uh, than than the way we measure the good life in the West, right, through consumption, the way. It was understood that the West uh, measured this consumption. Um, but even she is really unable to come up with anything other than sort of um, sort of these almost spiritual um, uh, uh, attempts to define beauty through these people like Rorich or uh, the, these, um, uh, and sort of this Eastern mysticism, um, as well as falling da back on these questions of uh, this idea of creating beautiful products and this idea of efficiency and quality that's very, very important in this in in interest to design. So I think you're exactly right, and that was one of the real challenges of the, of the late social system that they were unable to meet, right? How can we find a new way to think about defining uh, um, uh, the good life um, and not resorting to consumption. So that's the first part of your question, and uh, um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about it. Uh, uh, the, the second deals, with, I guess, a question of periodization, right? About the question of how this period of late socialism is significant, and. Uh, um, so, and this question itself is also something of a two-part. I think you're very right that the countries of, uh, of East Central Europe, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, are both starting from a very different place in 1944. And they also uh, are able to, in many ways, um, provide a, a level of consumer um, or access to consumer goods that, is, that isn't matched in Bulgaria, right? Bulgaria is starting from, from, uh, from a different place than, than is Hungary, and goulash communism under Kadar is much more successful at providing uh, uh, apartments and cars and, uh, and, and those types of things. Uh, so uh, I, I'm absolutely um, not trying to make a, uh, a study of all of Eastern Europe in this question of consumption, but I am very foc interested in focusing on Bulgaria. And I think periodization is very, very important. And I think it's in part 
um, for exactly the reasons that, that Jivkov talks about. I mean, the, the early stage of building socialism is one where it's uh, an intensive focus on heavy industry. It's, uh, it requires a low level of technical sophistication. Right, You're building these blasters. You don't need specialists. You don't need engineers, at least not to the level that you do by the time you get to the 1960s and 1970s. And so there's this real um, push uh, beginning in the 1960s towards efficiency, towards quality, towards moving to the next, to the next, uh, to the next. And it's not merely moving from heavy industry towards fulfilling consumer desires. It's also a certain level of technical efficiency, technical precision that is that is very, very important. And I, and I think you see also this larger generational shift, right? People are um, a generation removed from uh, from the revolution and they want to see some return on their investment. And so I think uh, the discourse, the practices, and the lived experience of people in the 1960s, 1970s is radically different than that at the early stages of communism. And I think it, it, uh, it bears it out in questions of consumption, questions of expectations, and also, uh, and I talk about this a great deal in the book, in a sense of actually developing this, this late socialist middle class, right? This in bourgeois mall that I talk about looks very different. It looks very successful in the 1960s and 1970s in a way that it doesn't in the 1980s. And so that transition is something that I'm very interested in. I don't know if that answered your questions. Yeah, well, it provokes further questions. Well, well we have, we'll have a beer afterwards um, or sometime. Thank you. Mm. I have a question. Okay, you please. Um, it's, it's more of a commentary, in fact, of how this consumerism was addressed after the collapse of communism. Mm -hmm. Because in the West, we know that boredom is there in the same way with modernity. Mm -hmm. And the answer was and has been more consumerism, more mm -hmm. diversified, and more of it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, as we move further and further, further into post-industrial society, this keeps to be mm -hmm. this time that Jose like, talks, talks about mm -hmm. speeds up ever faster, mm -hmm. or, or it appears to. Right. Uh, and I, I always, you know, thought of the, of the transition in terms of uh, consciousness mm -hmm. as Bulgarians changing their window frames, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that uh, Bulgarians survived the transition without ever stopping to think about the significance of that, and they engaged in consumerism and renovating their apartments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that was probably part of this dissociation of the consciousness not being able to catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I would be very curious to, to try, trace this into the early transition mm -hmm. uh, and see where this boredom, boredom was carried on today, mm -hmm. especially in the first years when, when it was, you can consume. Right. 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 Did or you? At least you were allowed to. Right. I don't, do I need to repeat that, or did you guys get that? Out? Well, anyway, she was asking about this trend, the transition. Uh, I guess after the changes, uh, it's a little, I've never done this before. <laughs> but uh, no, actually, um, they okay, they got it. okay, good. Um, that's an excellent question, um, and uh, I think one of the one of the one of the starting points for my research, one of the reasons I'm I'm, uh, I'm doing. Uh, this project goes back to, uh, I teach a 20th century history class at King's College um, where, I, where I live most of the time. And I, and I, and I, I really sort of want to take these, the, the sort of the challenges of the last third of the 20th century um, seriously as a worldwide critique of modernity, right, for lack of a better word. You know, we, we sort of throw that word around a lot. Um, uh, and so whether it's 68 in Paris or 68 in Prague, whether it's uh, 79 in, uh, um, in, in Afghanistan or Iran, I think these are all essentially commentaries on the idea of, uh, of, uh, of, of progress. They're challenging the idea of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the move away from, uh, from, from tradition. These are um, often understood in people's minds as a, as, a, as a way to understand, again, the life well lived measured through purchasing power, right, through the goods that you can, you can buy. And so I think we've entered into a, 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 in my mind, at least a long crisis period that dates back to maybe the first generation after the Second World War, right? So the first generation after the Second World War, they're essentially working hard to put the pieces back together. And then the second generation, uh, my father's generation, my mother's generation, um, they're, uh, they're, 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 they're sort of questioning the efficacy of it all, right? They're questioning whether or not that is, uh, in fact, a, um, 
a, a, a good way to measure the good life. And, there, and these are there, there are there are challenges that go back. You know, there's sort of an undercurrent that goes back to the, the transition that Kasevlik talks about, right? The the, the idea that uh, uh, of moving from apocalyptic to progressive time. And so I think what you get beginning in the 1960s and really continuing, and I think it's 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 certainly not gone away. I mean, the, whether you're talking about the Arab Spring, whether you're talking about uh, I mean, a number of other things, these are questions that are fundamentally about how one defines the good life, right? And so the and I think. Mm, I, I, I haven't talked to enough people. I don't know that I have a good answer as to why, you know, how, how, how Bulgarians today understand the good life. And I think you're absolutely right that, you know, whether it's changing window shades or whether it's, you know, painting the outside of the blocks or, or whatever the case may be, that, that consumption is at least part of that, that answer. And I think the, the critiques that begin in the 1960s and continue throughout um, about this question of consumption are something that that uh, that are, are a debate that's still ongoing. So I don't know that I, I have an answer as to whether that's. No, it's not a, a yeah. question. Yeah. That, you know, begs an answer. Uh, but it's I. A question. But 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 I. But I'm struck by when in teaching this class, I do a whole series of uh, of lectures on and discussions about 1968, and I'm struck about the fact that I, I was struck. Uh, it was maybe a month ago, walking down the street, and it was a. Uh, I forgot what Bulgarian newspaper was, but it was it was a you know it was a request for capitalism with a human face, right? <laughs> and, and, and I'm and I'm and I'm struck by this mid or this late century reaction against bureaucratization, modernization, rationalization, routinization that um, that does at least represent a potential fissure. And right? I'm not sure uh, what's going to come of it. It's Kafka all over, absolutely, and it's uh, and uh, and the and the idea is that as long as as long as we're able to change our window sh our window frames uh, with enough rapidity that somehow we'll yeah, I don't know not to get too philosophical we'll 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 we'll, 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 we'll not pay attention to the yawning void that is our life is uh, that's I'm I'm being over the top on purpose <laughs> is is at least a, a question worth asking I think right um, and I and I don't know I, that's. Well, thank you very much for being here with us. Thank oh, you for thank the wonderful you. and very uh, intriguing and untraditional lecture. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, it, is, uh, it is great to have you, and I hope that you visit us sometime in the, ba in the future when you come back. To well, I, uh, I, hope, I hope to. I hope thank to. you for being here, and uh, we can go for a beer now. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Thank you. This program is brought to you by AUBG Talks. For more, please visit us at aubg.edu slash talks.